Okay, guys, here's a quick rundown of uh, what we covered in class today, the nuclear atom, and we're adding a little bit more on top of this, and there'll be a couple problems for you to do along the way. Um, this is covered in 4.2 and 4.3 of the chemistry book, uh, pages 108 to 113. So uh, as we reviewed again today in class, uh, Rutherford's gold foil experiment shot this uh, beam of alpha particles, positively charged particles at the gold at gold foil, and uh, and looked for the where they ended up on this fluorescent screen surrounding this this arena, um, and saw most of those particles ended up going straight through. But every once in a while, they got bounced off, um, and that led to a revision of Thompson's plum pudding model, which protect which pr predicted that this positive diffuse field of positive charge that was there to cancel out the negativity of the electrons wouldn't really prov uh, provide a barrier. However, the fact that some of those uh, of those alpha particles bounced off or even bounced back um, suggested that there had to be something very dense that prevented them uh, and positive that prevented them from going through. Um, and so the, the revision that uh, Rutherford proposed, Rutherford's nuclear atom, kept the electrons, these very small negative bits of uh, massive charge, um, and uh, added the nucleus, maintaining the positivity, uh, which could attract the uh, electrons and cancel out their negative charge. Um, but it was small, dense, and uh, had most of the atom's mass. And it needed to be really small, and the electrons needed to be flying around in mostly empty space to explain why the, uh, the, go the alpha particles were able to pass most of the time unscathed, undeflected through the gold. Only when they got really close to this small, dense piece of positive charge were they deflected or even rebounded to where they came from. Um, and so the nucleus was his additional. We've got all the positive charge and most of the mass centered in this dense little bit. This, po this uh, electrostatic attraction holds these electrons in orbit around the nucleus, and that's key. They don't all come speeding into the nucleus because um, they're in motion uh, surrounding it in that empty space that surrounds that nucleus. Um, and so what we've really done here is we've walked through the major revisions that took place in the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, and the evolution of atomic theory, going from Dalton's billiard ball model, the unitary indivisible atom. Um, Thompson's cathode ray experiment showed that there had to be these little bits of negative charge, which he added to his plum pudding model, uh, these electrons that could come off the atom under the right set of circumstances. He had them floating around in the diffuse positive charge. And then Rutherford's experiment with the gold foil and the fluorescent screen and the alpha particles uh, showed that you, this didn't really work. You had to revise it again, adding the very dense negative char positive charge in the nucleus and most of the mass, mostly empty space surrounding, and these electrons flying around in that empty space being held there by the positive charge of the nucleus. So this evolution of atomic theory um, is pretty close to where we are with the atom today, although today we added a little bit more about the nucleus. And we're not going to go into the details about the experiments that led to that. They do exist, and you can go look into them if you like, but I'm not going to hold you responsible for them. You are responsible for these experiments and why they led to the revisions and the theory that we're talking about today. Um, but uh, so our current picture of the atom when we walked out of class today was the idea that there's this electron cloud with the electrons flying around in it, and the nucleus, where the positive charge is. And again, this is not drawn to scale here. It would be much, much larger, this area where these electrons could be found, um, relative to this, a nucleus this size. Um, but just for keeping it on the page here, this is the idea. Um, and again, now we've got, uh, in addition to where these things are arranged and how they're arranged relative to one another, um, we got to do the, the census of particles that are here. And so the particles that are, that are present in the atom uh, are the electrons we were starting with, with a charge of negative one. The protons are the ones, and neutrons are the ones we added today in the nucleus. So these guys are found in the nucleus, protons and neutrons. The proton has a charge of plus one, and the neutron is neutral, no charge at all. And they both have the same mass at one atomic mass unit. The electron with its negative charge, equal and opposite to that of the proton, um, has much less mass, only about one two thousandth of one the mass of one of these guys. So when we think about the mass of an atom, we're really going to ignore the mass contributed by the electrons and focus by on the mass that's contained within the nucleus. So when we now look at an atom, we can keep track of some things. We have some ways to think about how atoms would be different. They'd be different because they have different numbers of each of these different kinds of particle. 
Um, and that was something that Dalton had no clue about and that this new vision of the atom gives us a, an ability to do, to understand why atoms of different materials should be different. And so the things we can keep track of about an atom, first of all, is something known as the atomic number, which is the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom. And it turns out that atoms of an element, of the same element, all have the same atomic number. And it's the atomic number, when we look at the periodic table, we've talked about this organization of all the elements, those things that can't be broken down by chemical reaction. Uh, we've talked about this organization a couple of times. We divided elements up. Everything to the right of this line is a non-metal. Everything to the left of this line is a metal. Well, we can add one more piece of information to this table in the way these things are organized. They're organized as we go right to, uh, from left to right and from top to bottom. They're organized by atomic number. The one number that rises by one as you go left to right across the page and then keeps going as you return to the next line is the atomic number, the number of protons in the nucleus of each of these elements. The other things we can now characterize about atoms uh, is something known as the mass number, it's something about how heavy they are. Most of the mass is contributed by the protons and neutrons. So the mass number in AMU, atomic mass units, um, is, the, is the sum of the number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. The last thing we can say about an atom and characterize about it is has to do with the balance between the number of positive protons and negative electrons, and that's the charge. And we calculate the charge of an atom by subtracting the number of electrons from the number of protons. If the number of these is the same, the number of positive charges equals the number of negative charges, we have a neutral atom. If the number of positive charges is greater than the number of negative charges, we have a positive atom. And vice versa. If the number of negative charges, electrons, is greater than the number of protons, we have a negative atom. And so we can then take a look at atoms like this one here and say a few things about them. So I'm going to give you a couple of problems to do and that'll be it for tonight. So if we take a look at this atom here, what's the atomic number, what's the mass number, and what is the charge of the atom that's drawn here? That's problem number one. Problem number two, there are three problems to do that sort of turn this around a little bit and ask you to say how many protons, neutrons, and electrons are there in a neutral atom with an atomic number of 11, a mass number of 22, an atom with an atomic number of 6, a charge of negative 1, and a mass number of 11, and finally a sodium atom with a charge of plus 1 and a mass number of 23. You're going to need to look at a periodic table for that last one. We'll talk about the answers and do a bunch more problems like this when we get together tomorrow.